Welcome back to the RightWave Audio community. My name is John, and for this video, we're going to do an overview of the recently announced Marantz Cinema Range that's going to be released over the next year. And this consists of uh, the AV processor, the AV10, and the AV receivers, the Cinema 40, 50, 60, and 70S. And these range in price from $1,199 to $3,499 for the receivers, and the single processor that they're announced is $7,000, the AV10. This is a much anticipated range as Marantz under new ownership now, and uh, having struggled in previous years with the HDMI 2.1 release, only having a single input, and uh, just really not hitting market expectations of having more channels available for that and, and working well uh, when you do have that. So this is their chance to get it right with a new styling. And I think they've hit it out of the park with what they've done as far as the industrial design. And we're all get into this and compare it against the models that they are replacing. Now it doesn't replace everything in the range and we'll cover those deficiencies but we're going to start with the cinema 70s and this 1099 dollars uh, unit it will come out sometime next year this is the slimline receiver this is the one that replaces the nr 1711 now what they've done with this refresh is given that same look and feel as their uh audio file grade, uh, two channel integrated amps, et cetera. And they've carried this forward to the cinema line, which I think was a very smart choice. Now we've never been great fans of the Marantz porthole. Uh, you know, yes, that was introduced early in the Marantz's heritage, you know, but I think the, what Marantz had in the mid seventies into late seventies with the blue lights and everything was really the exciting thing. And with this porthole, you can only display limited information. It's fairly small, right? And when you have rounded corners, you even have less real estate to work with. But anyhow, they seem to make it work with this incarnation of it. And I think they've done a very good execution. Even if it's not entirely functional, it looks great the way they've done it. I think it's a choice of materials as well as the design and uh, I think it's going to be very well received. And even the remote has been redone, revamped. It no longer looks like any remote from the 90s and the last decade. So um, yes, this is a receiver. With that, it has seven channels of amplification. Marantz continues to use class AB amplification and not class D, which is a little surprising, but okay, we'll go forward with AB. There's nothing wrong with it other than the fact it generates heat and, and it is a small enclosure. So that's why we thought they might have gone with class D, but nevertheless, still class AB. And we have written this down as 35 watts per channel, all channels driven into eight ohms because that is the value when you apply Marantz's 70% guarantee. Now, I understand that's a conservative rating, but what they've done is they publish this as 50 watts per channel, two channels driven into eight ohms. At 70%, that becomes 35 watts. And this is what we're going to show here. We're going to show the most conservative rating of this. We like that they've kept the headphone jack on the front. Now with the slimline receiver, you do not have a hidden door. All the buttons are exposed in the front and you just have that porthole uh, display on the front of it. Now turning it around to the back, you can see all the connections there and uh, clearly identify that it's Dolby Vision, Dolby Atmos, etc. Uh, we're going to compare it against the uh, prior generation, and that will reveal what the changes have been. Uh, the unit is also available in silver, but only in certain regions. So don't expect to have silver available if you live in the U.S. I don't know which countries they are going to make it available, but just keep in mind that it is. Now, comparing it against the NR1711, we can see the price difference. The NR1711, 
as $999 versus the Cinema 70S, which is $1,099. So it is $200 more than the NR1711. So expect to pay more for all of these new introductions. What we do see here, looking at them side by side, how much more attractive the new Morant styling is versus the old one. Generally, they've reused a lot of concepts. Now, they borrowed the porthole from other receivers. They still have the two big knobs, about the same spacing from one another, but the execution, the materials somehow look richer. And the, the remote, as you can clearly see, is much more refined. So I would much rather have the new Morant Cinema product in my home than the old generation. That's something for you to comment as we go along. I will note that both units are devoid of any balance connection, and we'll see that pretty much with all the receivers from Morant's. The other thing that's changed big is the Cinema 70S has dropped the composite and component video from the uh, inputs choices and as well as the outputs. This is something we've noted in past videos that we really didn't see a need for them this day and age. You know, HDMI uh, is the predominant carrier of audio signals nowadays. You still have a few using RCA connections. The quality between what you get out of component composite versus HDMI is night and day. So if you do have some old legacy product, it's not like you're trying to eke out the best quality out of that. You just want it to work so you can look, use something that's older. And uh, you could probably use a converter or some older receiver and just use that to convert the composite uh, component over. Or maybe your TV takes those in and, and you're all set. But I really don't think uh, manufacturers need to keep carrying the composite component video signals. Enough of the video for now. What we'll notice a lot of things in common that whether we're talking about the current generation or the cinema range that's replacing it, uh, 8K is available across Marantz. And so that's not like that's being added, but it's being added in a better way. Uh, we're also consistency here is uh, for the respective model, uh, current versus the cinema range, the wattages are the same. So the 7011 is a 35 watts per channel, uh, effective 35 watts, 50 watts as marked on the box, same as the 70S. We'll see that consistency as we go along. Okay, next model up is the Cinema 60. So obviously a taller unit. This will come out in the next few months. Uh, we've heard at the end of October, but you know there could be some further delays. Uh, so we'll just say pretty soon. Uh, this one is rated at 70 watts per channel, all channels driven and with the 70% guarantee. And that gets marked on the box as 100 watts per channel into two channels. And this pretty much adopts the same styling. Again, no hidden doors. All the buttons are on the front, but just taller using the same remote as the 70S. And when we look at the back of it, I mean, it's you know, really delivering the same uh, types of IO on it. Also available in silver in certain markets, not the US. And when we compare it against the SR5015 that it's going to replace, again, we see a price increase, but this uh, at a higher amount. So we're moving from $1,300 to $1,700. So that's a $400 difference versus $200. So as we go up in the model range, you're paying more for the newer generation product. Uh, this is also class AB amplification. It is also seven channels. So you're just getting this, you're getting the same amount of channels, the same amount of processing, but you're getting that higher wattage, albeit not a huge increase uses the same remote. You know, looking at the back of this, again, we see that the composite and the component video is has been dropped between these two models. We do have a picture. Now, Marantz hasn't released a lot of information about these yet. There's no manuals you can find online, at least on the Marantz public site. 
and there is no interior shots. In fact, one of the comments that came in, somebody says, hey, can you give us some interior shots? I said, nope, whatever's on the website is what's available. So they're not releasing everything yet, but we did grab this was a audio advice promotional uh, uh, piece that we found. We're not sure if this was the cinema 50 or 60 being shown, but it gives you an idea what these things could look like inside. Definitely they're using E-Core uh, transformers and not toroidal transformers. And now on to the Cinema 50. And I think this is where you get a big jump in capabilities when you go from the Cinema 60 to the Cinema 50. Now it is about $1,000 more. Now it is about $800 more, but I think that's justified in this case uh, if you can afford it. You may not need the extra channels. Uh, you may not need the extra amplification, but there's other things within the 50 that also help justify the price. And we'll hit all those as we go along. But this is $2,499. We expect this. And then again, the next coming months, this is the one of the two models the 50 and the 60s that we're going to see first. This one's rated a little higher on its amplification. This is 77 watts, all channels driven. It gets marked on the box as 110 into two channels. So if the 70% rule applies here. Again, class A, B amplification and pretty much looks like the 60 except for the little logo on the front but uh, this one does have a hidden door on it. Uh, and uh, you know, we can open that up and it exposes the buttons here, but you know, no display on, underneath. You just still have the porthole display, so you don't gain anything uh, from that perspective. What I like is they kept the headphone jack out of the hidden door area, so no longer do I have to open up that hidden door to get my headphone plugged in. I think that's a nice move and it makes it symmetrical with the power button from a visual aspect. Now one thing you'll notice on the Cinema 50 is there are 11 pairs of binding posts on the back of it, but only nine amplifications. This is all handled through configuration and whether you're going to use that 11th, 10th, and 11th um, binding posts pair depends on the configuration, but only nine binding posts can be active at a time for that given configuration. So uh, don't let that fool you. This is not an 11 channels of amplification. Uh, it gives you the options to wire 11 sets of speakers or do some by amplification there. So keep that in mind. Also available in silver for certain markets, not the US. And when comparing it against the SR6015, the price differential widens. The 6015 was $2,000. This is $2,500. So there is a $500 difference uh, when you go up to the Cinema 50 from the 6015. So the 6015 was in introduced a couple of years ago in 2020. You know, is also delivering that same wattage uh, into the nine channels. Uh, also class A, B, so no changes there. You know, also had that porthole design and, uh, and had the trap door. But hidden behind the trap door was the headphone jack. So that has been moved out as, as we talked about earlier. And again, looking on the back, no surprise, the component and composite capabilities of the 6015 are gone in the cinema series. So this is very consistent. Otherwise, a lot of the same uh, items on the back of this. And we'll talk more about changes on the HDMI count later, but there is a change there as well. And this is one area that it loses a channel. Uh, but uh, looking inside, again, there's no published photos of the interior. This is also from Audio Advice. Uh, and we're not sure if this is the 50 or 60 being shown, but um, again, emblematical of what it could look like inside. And now the Cinema 40. This is considered at the moment the flagship of the AV receivers 
of the cinema range. And this gives you 88 watts per channel at eight ohms into nine channels, all channels driven. This is the 70% rule, so it gets marked on the box as 125 watts, two channels driven. So we've put 88 watts here. Uh, again, it's not a huge change from the 77 watts of the Cinema 50. However, we hear that the 40 has a little better power supply, a little better components, a little better capacitors, and is made in Japan versus Vietnam. And that helps justify the $1,000 increase over the 50. Otherwise, this is a very similar unit. It's got the same number of amplifiers, the same number of channels of processing, 13 channels of processing uh, as the 50, but it sells for $1,000 more. And again, as we go into this a little deeper, you'll see some of the other things that they're using to justify the, uh, the cost increase. And here's the Cinema 40 with the hidden door open. And you can see that this one has a two-line LCD display and some infographics on it as well. And this mimics a lot of what it looks like with the older unit that it replaces. So uh, before we show that side by side, I'll do mention that this is available in silver in some markets, but not the US. And down with looking at it side by side, Again, very similar, but that new cinema of uh, industrial design, I, I'm gonna say it several times on this, it's so much better than the prior generation that stuck around for over a decade. Uh, it was um, definitely getting uh, uh, old. And uh, I, I don't think, from my perspective, it was ever that winning of a design. I think Marantz has hit they're one of their iconic designs again. Um, I, I go to this, the 70s designs and then jump to this, and I think they've renewed themselves on the design, not just the, what they're delivering for, for capabilities. So now we're going to look at uh, both of them with the door open, and we can see that the SR7015, which was selling for $2,800 um, that this is now $600 more, where well, this will be available sometime in 2023. We're told towards the end of the year. Uh, but the, the SR7015 uh, you know, is very similar in regards. You look at it with the doors open. They both have the two-line display. Both have the same type of buttons in there. Uh, and again, the phono jack for the uh, headphones is on the outside, which is really nice. And again, looking at the backs of these, the composite, the component capabilities have diminished, not gone away entirely. So if you need something, you may be forced into the uh, Cinema 40. If you need at least one component or a couple of composite video inputs, Cinema 40 is the really the only thing that's going to be delivering it. Uh, and then I don't think they're going to keep it going after that. And now on to the AV10. So we're off the receivers and on to the AV10 processor. But then you say, aren't you missing something? What is going to take the place of the SR8015? They don't have anything yet. And this is why I think there's a gap between the AV10 numbering convention. You can notice they're going back downwards, right? So that the higher the number, the lower cost the unit, and their most expensive unit is the AB10. Well, where is something that's 20 and 30? I think they're holding those slots. So I could envision them having a Cinema 30 come out, Cinema 30, that takes the place of the SR8015. Now, they haven't announced this or anything, but I suspect that's going to be announced sometime in the next year. And then what about the replacement for the 7706 processor? That could be the AV20. So, you know, time will tell. 
the other thing I find quite striking and in, in, in a negative way is the um, price of the AV10, $7,000. Now, they could justify it, you know, being that this thing has got better components and all that. Uh, it seems like they're trying to compete like the, with the Anthem AVM90, which sells in that ballpark, um, or something like an Arcam product. But this is going from a $5,000 flagship to a $7,000. They're jumping up $2,000. This is doing a 19 channels of processing. Now, that's something Marantz hasn't offered in the past. So that's exciting. Now, this, is gonna, this isn't available this year. Sometime late next year, you're going to get the AV-10. I wish it was coming sooner because I've been waiting and waiting and waiting um, for them to really refresh their flagship processor, and they only put out one or two models. So that's that um, is something I'm 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 really anxious to see how this thing performs against the receiver that can now work on work sort of like a processor separate in that processor only mode that they have, where they shut off all the amplifiers. So uh, there isn't a good back photo from Morant. So this is one I clipped off the internet as well that shows the connectors on the back. Um, and there isn't a front on picture of the door open. So I just, you know, I've got this one off the side, but uh, you know, when we compare this against the AV8805, we see that same cosmetic difference. The remote um, appears to be the same as what they're doing throughout the line. It doesn't, unless they haven't really posted the right photo yet, um, perhaps they're dropping that LCD screen that was on the remote prior to that uh, in the 8805, but we'll see. Um, the 8805, I said, um, I think it started around 5,000. I think it's up to $5,500 now. So it's really only a $1,500 differential, but uh, again, it is still a big jump. Now I simulated the door opening because I, from looking at some trade show photos and everything, the Inside that hidden door looks pretty much what's in the AV40. So I uh, fudged this photo up a little bit just to give you a sense of what it looks like compared against the 8805. Again, very similar with that headphone jack now on the outside. And here are the two backs uh, compared here. What I like about the new layout is they've got the balanced and unbalanced connectors right on top of each other. So the balance are below and then the unbalance is right above it. That to me makes a lot of sense rather than putting them in a different area there. Uh, then gone are all the composite and component video. So again, it's only the AV90 that you at least even get uh, one or two of each type. But they did leave a balanced input, which we like to see. We're going to get into the differences on the inputs. But you know, that covers all the models. Now we're gonna do the side-by-side -side comparisons. And look, it all fits into a whole family here. They just get a little taller as you go along here. Uh, you can see here that the 70S and the 60S go together. Uh, they both have it without an opening door. They got both seven channels of amplification. Uh, just that the 60 gives you that much more amplification but they're doing eight channels of processing uh, on those units. The 50 and 40 go together. They're both nine channels, but then 40 has more amplification. They're both doing 15 channels of processing. And then the AV10, which ups the games even further on, on processing to 19 channels of processing. So that is the quick overview of each model. Now let's get into the specifications. And we are always start with the speaker layouts. And you know, as you go through the range, you're going to see, uh, of course, the AV10 being 19 channels of processing versus the AV8805A it's replacing. It's so how do they go to 19 channels? They did it with independent, that is independent subwoofer outputs going from two to four. Four independent subwoofer outputs 
Remember I said that I think that competing with the Anthem AVM90, which also has four subwoofer outputs independent, and, uh, and it's priced accordingly. Well, they're giving you uh, also th that extra processing so you can always use front wides if you want, right? The, the AV8805 supported front wides. It also supported four rows of heights if you wanted to. Of course, that would be done as a trade-off. So if you wanted more heights, you couldn't do the front wides. Um, or you had to sacrifice your rear surrounds. It's just a choice whether you want that fourth row of heights or your rear surrounds. So uh, the choices get a lot easier when you have to do larger speaker counts and you've got for subwoofer outputs. <laughs> this is amazing. But it's also amazing they've covered, kept, carried the four channels of subwoofer outputs down to the Cinema 40 and Cinema 50. So now, on both the 40 and the 50, you can do a 7.4.4. That's seven base layers, four subwoofers, and four heights. You have the processing to do that, 15 channels of processing, plus you have the amplification less two channels. So you only need to introduce one external amplifier with two channels to do a full 7.4.4. So that is pretty awesome. Uh, the the 7015, uh, the SR7015 and the SR 6015, you know, could do 7.2.4 uh, there. And again, you would you could just add the two-channel amplifier. So it was, it's like from that, but you've got four subwoofers versus two. Now on to the Cinema 60 and SR5015, as well as we'll look on the next page here, the 70S and the NR. Uh, 1711, these are essentially 7.1 processors. Okay, they call them 7.2, but these are two subwoofers run in parallel. That's why they're marked in purple using our convention, that they're tied together and not discrete. So you can do 5.2.2, or you can do 7.2 with no heights. And that's pretty much your choice. So you're trading off a height versus your rear surround for the most part. And uh, yep, you, you've you got seven amplifiers in there and uh, you know it can power those. So that is the seven, Cinema 60 and the 70S and their respective counterparts and how they handle the layouts. Uh, but I do think you're you get a lot when you go to the Cinema 50, not just on the uh, speaker layout choices, but let's now look at the surround decoding formats. Now they all support Dolby Atmos, they all support DTSX as they did in the prior generations. The AV10 is the only one doing DTSX Pro. Nothing else is advertised to do that. You do get Oral 3D on the AV10, the prior generation AV8805, the Cinema 40, as well as the SR7015, and the Cinema 50. Now the Cinema 50 is adding Oral 3D, whereas its counterpart, the SR6015, did not. And you don't have Oral on any of the 7.x1s that you know, of course, don't have enough channels really to do oral 3D uh, justice here. So I'll just flip over to the Cinema 70S and NR 1711 just so you can see, you know, how that is just doing Dolby Atmos and DTSX. But going back to the larger listing here, we can see that they all have a quarter inch headphone jack and uh, it all have an AM FM tuner. And it's nice to see that they've got it in the AV10. They didn't seem to have it in the AV8805A 
although prior generations of their flagship processor did. So it's nice to have that back. Uh, they all have a removable IEC power cord, and but none of them have an outlet. And I think that's kind of a thing of a past to have a power outlet on the back of a receiver or a processor. Uh, and they all auto switch depending on your country uh, input voltage, whether that's 110 or 220. So that's all nice to see. And I'll flip over to the 70S 1711 to show you that's all the same there as well. So also to look at this with some of the other features, IMAX Enhance. You get IMAX Enhance uh, just as you did in the prior generation. So the 6015 up, which is the Cinema 50 now and up, all have IMAX Enhance. The 60 Cinema 60 down do, does not. They all support Dolby Vision, including the Cinema 70S and NR1711. Now here is where it gets interesting, is with the calibration. Yes, they all support Odyssey as it did in the past, but now with certain models in the upper range, the AV10, the Cinema 40, and the Cinema 50, there's going to be a paid option to get Dirac Live support for those three models. This will come sometime in the March timeframe as a software download and after you pay the license. Now, it's a little unclear if they're going to be, how they're going to be handling the base management, but I feel like they're going to offer both the single base and the multi-base options that Dirac have. You know, of course, you pay more as you go into the multi-base. I know Dirac is working on some spatial audio stuff, which may also see its way to Marantz. We're just going to have to keep an eye on it. We just don't have enough information at this time, and we don't know what it's going to cost. But the nice, the option is going to be there. Now, you don't have that option with the Cinema 60. This is another reason if you have enough money to go that extra $800 to the Cinema 50 from the Cinema 60, I recommend it. You get two more channels of, of subwoofer processing, independent processing. Even if you have two subwoofers, it's worth it because it's independent. Then you're going to have Dirac, and then you're going to have Oral 3D, and then you're going to have bump, bump, bump. There's more, right? So I think that's a good move. None of these support THX certification. That's an Onkyo Integra thing. They're pretty much the only ones doing it. Uh, moving on to the DAX, we have very little information here. In fact, I only have one clue. The one clue I got is if you look on the Marantz website, the AV10 chat um, question answers at the bottom of the product page, the, uh, somebody wrote in and says, what DAC is being used? And the Marantz representative said, well, we're using ESS. And that's as, all, as far as he went. So I know it's going to be an ESS chip. Now, we know that at some point, Morant switched off of AKM after the AKM fire and the chip shortage to ESS on some models. Uh, the 8805 was an ES9010 uh, with the specs listed here as well. Some of the other models, I believe they stuck with AKM, but I'm not 100% sure. If they did, it could be the 4458BN. Uh, regardless, Marantz for, um, now we don't have published output specifications, signal to noise, harmonic distortion for the new models, any of them. But if they're going to be as good or better, they would have to match the like the 8805A, the 7015, and the 6015 all gave a signal to noise output of 102 decibels at 0.008% total harmonic distortion, and that's a very good rating. Uh, PCM was 24 bit, 192 kilohertz, and DSD was the DSD 128, and through HDMI could give you multi channel. On the chat and also in the other parts of the Morantz website, they do talk about supporting still. DSD-128, I'm glad that they didn't drop that. I know Super Audio is not a really a format that's continuing in any big way, 
but some of us have it. And if you have streaming DSD files, you got an answer here and it's on all models. So that we can confirm, that's the one thing we can confirm for all these, they will support DSD 128 and below. Uh, and this is, and I'm gonna flip over to the Cinema 70 and NR7011, you know, where you can see, you know, the DSD is there, you know, but note that the quality, once you drop into the 7.1, 7.2 channel units, uh, the THD is down to 0.08%, uh, and the signal to noise drops to 100 dBs for the models that are specifying it. So that handles it for the DAX for what we know. Now on to the I.O. Now we alluded to changes in HDMI, and we can see, for example, the Cinema 50 is 6 HDMI in, versus the 6015 was seven. This is the instance where it has dropped one channel on total HDMI. It gets more redeeming when we look at the um, 8K stuff. But for right now, if the sheer counts, that's the only one that's dropping down. Otherwise, they've stayed consistent for what they support for HDMI. Mostly seven or six inputs and two outputs. They all support two coaxial and two optical digital inputs. They don't have any of the high-end AES, EBU, or AIO, IP that you might see in a Storm or, or JVL synthesis prod product, but uh, uh, we don't really expect that from Marantz. Uh, that's not the market they're going after. Uh, it does support uh, multi-channel outputs, of course, on the processor that is balanced. Nice that they still have balance. So we've got 15.4 and 15.2 uh, from the older generation. We do see that, of course, the processors support multi-channel balanced outputs, but also unbalanced outputs. So you've got the 15.4 uh, outputs off the AV10. Uh, there is also support for uh, 7.1 inputs but not on the AB10. So if you have a multi-channel source, you want to bring that into the AB10 as HDMI. The other units, the Cinema 40, the 50, uh, and the older generation that they replace all had the 7.1 multi-channel inputs. Now the Cinema 60, like the SR5015 it replaces, uh, didn't have the 7.1 input on the multi-channel and either balanced or unbalanced. The AV10 is the only product with a balanced input uh, for a two-channel stereo. So I'd like that for like when I bring in my phonograph from a balanced uh, uh, Parasound, it's a Parasound phono preamplifier. I take the balance output from that. I'd like to be able to use that, and I can't with the receivers. I'd have to go up to the, the processor model. The uh, analog inputs range from four channels up to six. Uh, the AV10 does drop two channels off of what the AV8805 had to offer. Uh, and then it's all five channels of analog until you get to the Cinema 60 and it drops to four uh, there. And they all support a least one zone output. The AV10 and the Cinema 40 have two zones, whereas everything else is a single zone output. And as you can see, the component and the composite really drop off. And it's really only the Cinema 40 on the new ranges that have it. Now, they all still maintain a moving magnet. It's only moving magnet, not moving coil, which is pretty typical of receivers and processors. Uh, have that at least built in. It's kind of a starter kit for those who aren't too serious about their um, turntables. And we'll just flip quickly to the 70S and 1711 just to you know, see how that comes together there as well. Now, on to the video section. Now, I talked about other differences when it comes to 8K. All of the prior models only gave you one 8K input. On the new cinema range, you have uh, multiple 8K inputs, and in some cases, 
all the inputs are uh, 8K capable. That's the AV11, the Cinema 40, and the Cinema 50 give you 7N that are 8K capable. This is great. Um, no need to even think about it. Uh, but the Cinema 60 is half the channels that are, that are HDMI are 8K. So there's three 8K of the total of six. And this is the same with the 70S. And we'll flip to that page for a second here. 8K is three of the six versus um, one of the six is. So you're still doing better than the prior generation. Now where it does have 8K, it's giving you 4K 120 and uh, 8K 60 on those HDMI ports. Now we also have here the 2.1, other 2.1 features. So variable refresh rate, they all support it. The um, quick frame transport, they all support it. Auto low latency mode, they all support it. What they don't all seem to support, but we don't know for sure, is quick media switching. And this is when you switch sources and you don't get that black um, as you switch. It, it, it's more seamless. But they don't list it as supported, at least right now, it could be an error, on the Cinema 40, the Cinema 50, and the Cinema 60, or the 70S. They do list it for the AV10. Is this just an anomaly, uh, an error? Um, perhaps, we'll, we'll, we'll find out as things go. Remember, when products first get in, introduced, there's a lot of errors in documentation, so you, you can't, hold on to everything, but we're reporting it as we see it. Um, and, and why I think this is wrong is because why would the prior generation, the SR70, 15, 60, 15, 15, 15, et cetera, support it and these don't. But anyhow, on to the HDR formats. They all support hybrid log gamma. They all support HDR, HDR10, HDR10+. They all support Dolby Vision. It's on the IMAX that they don't all support it. Now, the Cinema 40 website doesn't mention IMAX, but it has the logo on the back of it. So we think it's pretty safe to say that the Cinema 40 has IMAX enhanced. But it isn't there for Cinema 60 um, or the Cinema 70S. Neither did its respective counterparts. And I'll switch quickly to the second page here that shows the Cinema 70S. Uh, and they all support uh, the copy protection HDCP of 2.3. So that's all up to the current there. Now on to networking. They all have an Ethernet port. They all have wireless. They all have Wi-Fi. They all have Bluetooth. Now we have to be careful about Bluetooth. Is is in and there's out Bluetooth. Not all ampli all receivers and processors support both directions. The good thing is Marantz is going the direction of supporting both. So they support it always streaming in, so like from a phone or a tablet, streaming to the, the receiver or the processor, but they didn't support Bluetooth headphones. Now they do. So the AV10, the Cinema 40, Cinema 50, 60, as well as the 70S all support Bluetooth to the headphones, but also the 1711 always did. So uh, it's just one of those things that they had it on that slimline processor before everything else. Now there isn't any advanced um, networking things that you see in a JBL synthesis or a Storm or Trinoff like Dante or AB, AVB or HD Base 10, et cetera. But uh, we don't, again, we don't expect that from the Marantz product. Control, they all support some sort of voice control. So they, and they're consistent across their range and, you know, supporting Alexa and Google uh, voice commands, as well as HomePod pod, uh, from Apple, where I, I see, again, it could be an error. They don't mention Josh AI anymore. They always had that, at least over the last few years, and now we're not seeing any mention of it. Again, it could be an error with their documentation at this point. They all support um, protocol control through Ethernet or infrared, whether that's wired or wireless uh, infrared, one in uh, the, what they call the, um, the bus, the remote control bus, and some have it in and out as well. 
They all have triggers of some sort. Uh, most of them support a DB9 serial connection. Uh, of course, the Cinema 70S and 1711 didn't have or don't have uh, though that's that uh, DB9 serial connection. Uh, so you'll just you have to use one of the more modern methods, which I think is fine. They all support integration with the likes of Control 4, Savant, RTI, Crestron, Elan, etc. Uh, all there. Now on to the streaming ecosystems. They all support AirPlay 2, assuming AirPlay is just as good as A2. Um, we can assume AirPlay if they do AirPlay 2. They don't support Chromecast or Sonos um, streaming ecosystems. They are Rune tested for all these models. They all support Spotify Connect. They're not a DTS PlayFi ecosystem, but they all are within their HEOS, their own HEOS like the Denon uh, also uses. They all work with that. And I'll just quickly look at the 70S. And of course, that's all the same. Uh, no differences between models there. And we see the same with the streaming internet services. Amazon Prime, Apple Music, whether it's HD or anything, Deezer, Napster, Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify, Sirius XM, Tidal, Tidal, but not MQA. We don't really see new companies adopting MQA. We have some holdouts like um, one of the few that offer it like uh, NAD, but not much happening uh, with adoption of MQA on the processor receiver side. Uh, they support tuned in for radio as well as iHeartRadio. One I don't know much about mood mix. I don't think they listed that in the past. Uh, this might be a newer addition to their streaming support. And quickly just turn the page to the 70S 1711. Same story there. They're consistent across the whole package. I, I just assume it's the HEOS uh, that's doing all that. Now, looking at the Marantz um, remotes here, the old generation versus new here, currently showing as every product uses the same remote for the cinema series. But as more information comes out, maybe there's some variants that really aren't published right yet. So we'll, we'll wait and see. But at least they've all been updated is the clue that we take here. They do look like they are from this decade now. And they're all backlit is what we also learned from the Q&A of the Morant site. The physical aspects here, and uh, you know, I'm not gonna read all of these. Obviously, I'm gonna go to the next page first. The Cinema 70 is the, the slimmest 4.3 inches, 109 millimeters, just a little bigger than the 1711. You know, pretty, uh, you know, not too deep, 14.6 inches, 372 millimeters. These start, you know, 18, 19 pounds, uh, around the eight kilogram um, uh, range on the, the low end. But then you get up to their bigger units. And just looking at their receivers, you know, obviously the Cinema 40 is, you know, got the better uh, power supplies, nine channels of amplification. That's going to weigh the most. That's 33.3 pounds. 15.1 kilograms. And when you compare that against the AV10, the AV10 weighs more with no amplification. That's 37 pounds. That's like four, almost four pounds more, 16.8 kilograms, right? Uh, whether you're looking at the Cinema 40 or the AV10, they're both 7.34 inches high, around 188 millimeters, about that. They're about the same with 17.4, uh, 442 millimeters. Uh, the depth, well, the AV10 is the deepest, 19 inches, 483 millimeters. So you got to think they're going to do some serious uh, business inside there if they need that extra depth with no amplification. The rest of them are no more than 16.1 inches deep, 410 millimeters. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea here. Obviously, as you move up the range, they get heavier and heavier. Uh, and uh, then thinking about the power consumption of the AV10, and these all share the same power consumption as the units that they're replacing. So they didn't really change the size of their power supplies. 
So the AV10 is 90 watts. The Cinema Cinema 40 is 710 watts. Cinema 50 is 680. The Cinema 60 is 650. And the Cinema 70S is 250 watts. And they all have a standby power of 0.2. Now on to a specification we're going to start adding on when we do our reviews is where these things are made and what is the warranty. The AV10, the AV8805, and the Cinema 40 are all made in Japan. One of those things that Marantz uses to help justify the premium price you pay for those units, but that's said to be you know, their most precise factory. They make everything else that's on this list in Vietnam. Now, if you look at Marantz's warranty, they say everything has a three-year warranty except for their reference products. So the Cinema 40 and the AV10 are shown as having five-year warranty at these uh, retail sites that I've been looking at. So uh, because it's not clear on the Marantz side if which ones are actually the reference. Uh, what I'm not sure about is the 70S because one retailer had that as a five-year warranty, but I find that hard to believe. I think it's probably a three-year because it's not a really a reference product. Now, we normally do at this point more of the software um, elements of the product, but we really don't have those details until we can get into the manual or get one of these in-house, hint, um, we we um, won't know really what how the software compares with these new cinema products, but we'll get into it. But what are your thoughts? Are you excited about this new range from Marantz? Or even if you're not running to it because you're favoring another brand, do you think Marantz is moving in the right direction? I really do think so. Uh, and I think they're with delivering Dirac and delivering for independent sub, on their premium models from the 50, Cinema 50 on up, this is big news. Um, I don't like the $7,000 price tag of the AV10. I think that's a little steep, but they, I still think they're gonna come out with an AV20 that comes in lower, maybe $6,000. So we'll see where that lands. Uh, you know, What are your other thoughts there? I mean, are you, a 7.1, 7.2 channel person and would normally consider a 70S or a 60, would you jump up to the 50 because of all the other things it offers, even if you're not using those channels? That feedback would be useful to the RipeWave audio community. And if you like this in video, please like and subscribe. And if you want to take it to that next level and have access to our research, our RipeWave Audio database, and all these slides, think about joining in with Patreon. It would really help us. www.patreon.com slash RipeWave. And with your subscriptions, we're going to be able to get more things in-house. We don't have affiliation with um, manufacturers at the moment. So this channel is somewhat it's self-supporting or I kick in my own money uh, in some cases or most cases to date. Uh, so if you want to help bring more things in that we can make uh, more firsthand analysis, that would help us. But regardless, be sure to hit that bell icon so you'll be noticed when the next video is published. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.